Hi, welcome to Bad Music Taste and Other Ways to Ruin Your Life. My name is Dominic. And my name is Sam. Dominic has a record this week. This week's record is My War by Black Flag. This record was first released in 1986, and the copy I have here is a first pressing on black vinyl. Anyways, today we're talking to Ian Mackay of Fugazi, Kariki, and Discord Records. How's it going, Ian? Very well, thanks. What, what is the significance of the copy of My War? Why do you show your record of the week? What is it? I mean, the record you listened to this week, or what does it mean? It's really just a record we want to give props to, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You like that record? Absolutely. What's your, what's your jam on there? What's the song you like the most? Oh, I really like Beat My Head Against the Wall. Yeah. <laughs> you know which one I always I really love is Three Nights. It's on the oh. B-side. It's a heavy one. But Henry really brings it on that one. He really... It's a good performance on that particular song. And that was a really interesting record when they put that out. I remember um, I think the bass player is listed as Dale Nixon, I think. Yeah. Um, it's actually Greg Ginn. I think he plays bass on it. Uh, he played guitar and bass. And uh, it was the record they put out after their original bass player, Chuck Dukowski, left the band. And um, the, there was a, lo- a, whole, a lot of tension in that record as a result of that, of that particular era. So that record was really representative of a, a shift in the Black Flag history. It's a really in, very interesting record, very strange sounding. Yeah, if you were to go from like Nervous Breakdown or their first album to My War, it's a very interesting, right. like, yeah, switch or change. And don't forget Jealous Again, the 12 inch too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was a black. I mean, I was a certain. I was a student of Black Flag. I was really, you know. Of course, Henry was my best friend. You know, Henry started singing for them in 1981. Um, but he, I had known him. I met Henry when I was 11 years old. Oh wow! He grew up here. So he grew up. He was 12. I was 11. Um, and we met. He lived in my neighborhood, Glover Park, here in D.C. And then um, uh, we became skateboarders together for a number of years. We. He, Henry and I actually took a Greyhound bus from Washington to California to go skateboarding. I was 16 and he was 17. And we, we went all the way across the country together and back um, on our own just to go skateboarding. And then we got into, really got into punk together. Uh, and Black Flag was our favorite band. And I remember they, in 1980, February of 81, the guy had called SST Records um, their record label and Chuck Dukowski answered the phone and I just started talking to him like, hi, I'm Ian. I'm from Washington, DC. I would have been 18 years old at the time. And um, we became like phone buddies. And then they came East, they played in New York and we all went up from DC to go see them in New York. And then they came to Washington to play and they stayed at my, I lived at home and they stayed with me and my family like in the basement on the floor with me and my family house um all the black flag for two or three days and so henry was there we were all hanging out all the time together with the black flag people and then they left and were making their way back across the country and we were reading Flipside magazine which is from la it was a fanzine and they reported that black flag was looking for a new singer that des the singer wanted to play guitar and so they um there was a lot of speculation. Who's going to be the new singer of Black Flag? And Flipside Magazine was mentioning different possibilities. And we were all really excited to see who was going to sing. And then in May or June of 81, I get a call from Henry. And he says, guess who the singer for Black Flag is? <laughs> and I said, who? He goes, me. And I, I didn't make any sense to me. Like how I, I was like, what? And I was like, are you, you're messing with me? He said, no. Like I, I'm, I'm in the band. If I want to be, should I do it? And I was like, uh, you definitely should do it. But what happened? And what had happened was Black Flag came around the country and went to different towns where they had met people they thought were interesting and maybe possibly be singers. And they had him try out. And I guess Henry was on that list. Henry told me that I was next on the list. I don't know if it's true or not, um, <laughs> but it never would have worked anyway. Is it, we had a totally different, the way I, my ideas, my, op, the way I operate was very different than Black Flag. So, <laughs> but it, it was, but Henry, but also Henry was the perfect singer for the band. So if you were, if you were offered, would you, would you have like tried it out or just said no? I was in minor threat. 
so I don't think okay. I would have, I don't, I think I'm, I tend to be really, um, I'm a devoted guy. If yeah. I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Um, Henry was in a different situation. He was an SOA, but SOA was sort of faded. They, they were going to go to college probably. And I mean, mm. somewhat true with Meyer Threat that we may not still, you know, I knew Lyle, the guitar player, was going to leave. But Meyer Threat was a more accomplished band than SOA probably. I think it's a fair thing to say. And I think Henry just didn't know what to do with himself. He had different, very different circumstances. Like he had basically been thrown out of his house he had been he slept like he stayed at our house or he slept in his car. Then he finally got an apartment and he was working this ice cream shop trying to raise enough money just to pay a rent. And like I had a family, like my parent, you know, I lived at home still. Yeah. I had a whole scene. So I was pretty well grounded. He was less grounded. So I think had they asked me, I probably I would have been it'd been interesting to um I would have thought about it, I guess, but I can't imagine I would have said yes. And if I had said yes, I can't imagine it would have lasted very long. I'm yeah. Yeah. I'm too um, like there's things I will do and there are things I will not do period. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the things that some of the things that they were, the, the, some of their, um, their operation were things I just would never have done. I never would have agreed to it. Wow. Okay. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know that yeah, you were right. like <laughs> next in line for, I don't know. Black and Black. also to be clear, it's very possible that Henry said that to make, to not to sort of make it not hurt my feelings. You know, oh. tried, I don't know <laughs> yeah. if it's, I don't know if it's true. I just know that he told me no one from black flag has ever told me that. Just Henry told me that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, I did, they were, they were our favorite band at the time. And the Nervous Breakdown 7-inch was, for me, a, a defining piece of art. And the song I've had it specifically was a song that just, um, I really thought was a perfect piece of music. Yeah, yeah. But anyways, Kariki just released a new record back in July. So what is it like releasing a record during COVID without like the support of a tour? Um, well, <clears throat> let me first re address the idea of the tour supporting a record, which is that is the way the music business operates, that you, people go on tour to support the sale of a record. But if you stop and think about it, why is the record the most important thing? Why would you be, why would bands go on the road in service of a piece of plastic or a digital stream. What's going on there? That's an inversion. That's what you call, that's a marketplace inversion. In my opinion, records really are put out to support the tour or the band. The, you know, Fugazi had a, we had a, a mantra, which was the record is the menu and the show is the meal. <laughs> So the idea was that you put a record out and then people can familiarize themselves with your music. So then when you go play the show, they can hear what happens to those songs in that live setting when we make a show together, right? So yeah. the record industry, of course, wants everyone to work in service of their aim, which is to sell records. But that's not, for me, what a band is about. A band is about making music and music is, a, is, a, is really focused on bringing people together. That's the aim. That is that for me is the high point. The records is in service to that. Right. So, yeah. so that's the first thing I want to address is this, this notion that you can't tour to support a record. I would never tour to support the sale of a record. Okay. Right. No. Okay. So that's just number one uh, in terms of the timing you know, the record, actually, we recorded the record and we're done with it a year before it came, over a year before it came out. And for a variety of reasons in the fall, we had a lot of technical issues and just schedule, just weird schedule stuff. We finally didn't actually get the record, wasn't start, really got into being made until, we didn't get it made until February. Um, and our release date was set for March twenty. Sixth, which if you'll remember, was basically right in the 
beginning of the shutdown, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we, the record label, like this is, we're talking about specifically like the date 26 for the vinyl and CDs, the physical components of the release, you would start shipping that out about two to two and a half weeks earlier. The first things you would ship would go to say overseas distributors because it takes longest for the yeah. record to get there. Then you would ship to your distributors, right? Because then they would, because they'd have to ship to stores. Then you would ship to your stores, which, and then you would ship to the people. And the idea is to make it all land around the 26th. So we were going to start shipping on the 15th of March. On the, that weekend, we, you know, the pandemic was coming and we could, it was a, things were starting to get quiet and people were yeah. like, I, knew, I went to two different gigs. I won the 930 and one of the Black Cat were both the last, they were the last shows. Like I just happened to go and then, and they both were like, we're out of business. Like we're going to shut down because we can't, this is too crazy. Um, so then I went over that weekend knowing that everything was closing down and also thinking about the fact that the the shipping lanes were may get clogged with um, medical stuff. Yeah. I, I went on Monday morning, which would have been the uh, 13, 14, 15, 16th, Monday the 16th. I went on Monday morning and I said to the, you know, the people at Discord, like, we need to get, we can't stagger our shipments. We got to put it all out right now. Get it in the mail now before we lose the shipping lanes. So we started thinking about, okay, how can we do it? We'll get everything out on Tuesday. Let's make a, a plan. Then Monday, San Francisco closed. They shut down everything. And it suddenly occurred to me, if we ship records, they're going to either land, they could land at stores that are closed, the doors will be locked, or even worse, they'll arrive at the store and then the door will be locked. Mm. So you have records sitting inside. Yeah. And I immediately, I, I got up at 4.30 or 5 in the morning and I, I, re, I thought about this. So I wrote to one of my people and I said, call me as soon as you wake up. And he called me. I said, abort. Like we're not shipping anything out at all because it's not right. Like we need to let, this is not the right time to put out a record. And we're going to delay the release because even though we could, we could ship out the mail order, we had thousands of mail order already waiting. Uh, it's not fair to the stores. We, yeah. could ship to some, we could ship to some of the stores, but it's not fair to the distributor. And we could have put it up digitally, but that's not fair to anybody. So instead, we just put a cap on it and said, wait, we're not going to do anything at all. Um, we're going to let this play out and see what happens. And then we'll find a timeline that will make sense for everybody and the best we can. So we just it ended up being delayed till June. It came out in June, ultimately. June 20th, I think, was the... Um, and I feel really, I feel good about it. I felt like it was that um, as a Discord, as a record label, you know, what we've done would not have been possible without the assistance uh, or without the um, partnership with independent record stores and independent distributors. Um, so with that in mind, uh, it would make no sense for us to do something that would be in uh, in opposition to their livelihoods. Like we, yeah. we got to support them the best we can, even if, you know, who knows what's going to happen. You know, this next round of shutdown might be just crippling. I don't know, but you got to go down swinging. Right. Yeah. The, the thing that sucks about it is like, there's no end in sight. Like if in, yeah. if in March they would have been like next April, then you'll be free to go. Like, I think then it would have been just hunker down till April. But now it's like everybody's just so eager to get out there because they don't know. Right. Like when they're going to be able to again. So it's. Yeah. It's, 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 I hear you. Um, I think that. I mean, I feel like the time. People want things to be sort of tidy. Um, but really, every day we just are. You know, we're just here. So, yeah. um, 
and we have to deal like I think of life as it's like weather. So like right now in Washington, D.C., where are you guys? Are you in Jersey? Oh, where are you? we're in Baltimore. Baltimore. We're in Baltimore. Okay. So you know what the weather's like right now. It's a little <laughs> chilly outside, right? Yeah. So put on a sweater, right? And if it's raining, bring an umbrella or, you know, if it's snowing, you know, put on your mittens or whatever. Like that's the weather. And we, can, can t- we can't control the weather. And so we dress accordingly, right? That's the way it works. I think if we thought about life somewhat in the same way, it would be easier. Instead of thinking like, we don't just think like, well, it's going to rain for, we know it's going to stop raining at three o'clock. So we're just going to wait till, we just let it happen. And I think that in this situation, it's clearly out of our control. I mean, I think most things are out of our control, but this is a situation that is clearly out of control. The only thing we have in our control is our own behavior, right? And so instead of thinking like, well, this is hard because we don't know when it's going to end, think about this is not hard. I just need to be like, I just need to do what I'm doing. Like you guys are doing something interesting. You know, you're, you're checking. I'm, I imagine you're studying music by the fact you pull up a My War record, like you're studying you're, you're engaging in things like this in many ways is a, it's an unbelievable period of time. Now I'm not, don't mean to make any light of the, the suffering caused by death and illness and by people's financial situation. I'm not, there's no, I'm not making light of that whatsoever. Having said that, um, you know, this is an, an, an example of the way how pliable and how, uh, um, able and flexible we can be to navigate circumstances that are beyond our control. And that's a good thing to learn and to stay positive about it. Yeah. I mean, it, as bad as it is, there's absolutely a couple positives to it. Like I, oh, we, yeah. w- we wouldn't have started the podcast if it wasn't right. for, right. for a bunch right. of time. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, we never would have thought about even doing it. Like Dominic said, we never probably would have even like went into music as much as we have. Like we were both really into music before, but it's like now we have more time on our hands to kind of, you know, dig deeper and like research new stuff. Right. Is really cool. You know, like we can't, you know, go outside and hang out with like all of our friends at school, but right. we at least we can find some way to stay connected to talk to people, you know? Right. And I, <laughs> I have a couple of thoughts too, which I remember when this thing first started and people are like, oh my God, our, you know, our, we're going to be siloed. Our kids won't be able to. And I always think about like the kid who's like parents run the, like have the lighthouse on an island or something back right. in the old <laughs> days where they had, they had no nothing, like no telephone, nothing. It's just yeah. them and their parents running the lighthouse. <laughs> I mean, and I think they seem to get through it. You know, they figured it out. And th- that's one thought that, you know, it's that we're not as isolated as, as we could be. That's for sure. Um, yeah. The other thing to think about, and this is thing I always try to encourage, like I'm assuming that you're aware, you like, like you guys were aware of say Fugazi or Meyer threat. Um, like w- at what point did you first hear of those bands? Like, um, I mean, I've been listening to minor threat almost my entire life. Cause my parents were fans. Okay. So, so with that in mind, let's say f- six months ago, would it have been, you were familiar with Meyer threat at the time, right? Yep. All right. Would it have been conceivable to you that you'd be having this conversation with me right now? Absolutely not. No, not all right. All. So, so, <laughs> so what do you know about the future? Nothing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> See, and that's the thing. We don't know about the future. The future is always around the corner. Yeah. It's always a point that we can't get to because when we get to it, it's the present. So the most important thing is to make sure that your vehicle yourself moves that you keep going around the corner you know that's the most that's all we can do and that's a really different way of thinking about it and i often think about like i was talking to two guys from moscow the other day on on this a call like this and i remember thinking um i couldn't have imagined this ever would have happened i'm so glad that I kept my vehicle clean. I kept going, kept going forward. I didn't, I didn't stare in the, I don't, I don't really ever think about the future. And I think, you know, you guys, 
when you're kids, um, I imagine you might hear from some people things like, where do you see yourselves in five years? Or what do you think you're going to do in yeah. 10 years? That is the most ridiculous question. I don't know why people think they, well, I don't know why adults ask children this question or adults ask adults that for that matter. I find it to be a totally ridiculous question. They don't know where they're going to be in five years, you know? So why are they asking you where you're going to be? And the other thing is, I think that there's a tendency for um, adults to um, kind of, they often will say to children, like, well, at some point you're going to have to get real. Like they'll say things like, you know, like at some point you're going to have to get real. You have to make some real serious decisions. And I think the message to kids in that situation is that they are not real. Right. Yeah. And I reject that wholeheartedly. Kids are real. Kids are human beings and they are fucking real. They're real. (laughs) And, and I think that if you tell a kid, if you tell him or her um, that they're not real um, at some point, they might start believing that. And if they start believing that, then they, their behaviors might reflect the fact that they're not real. They might do things that they, if they're told like at some point they're gonna have to get real. So everything they do now doesn't count. Right. And at some point when they get real, then they'll van- they'll get rid of all the mistakes they've made. I think if you tell kids or anybody that you're real and that your ideas and decisions are valid, that kids will make decisions that are smart because they're realized that it counts. But, you know, it's just a, a d- different way of thinking about things because that's how I, that's, I always think about things differently, I guess. I've never, I mean, I've never thought about it that way, but I mean, that's a really good point. Like when you're a little kid, like that's what everybody says to you. And like, even a lot of people, you know, when we're like teenagers, they're like, oh, well, at some point you're going to have to think for yourself. And it's like, grow up. Like, right, <laughs> right. It's like, well, who says I'm not, you know, like I can't yeah. speed up the aging process. <laughs> right. And I'm here to tell you that you're real. You're already real. Both of you are real. And you're just, and what, and I actually think all kids are real for even little, little kids. Now, there's experience, you you know, you have different kinds of experiences. Like, you know, I'm almost 60. So I have a lot more experiences probably than you do. Um, but there doesn't mean it's more, I'm more valid. It just means it's the same way. Like when you first start walking, you know, you get on your feet and you think I'm standing up and you might take a couple of steps, but the trail behind you is short, right? The trail behind you is short, but the longer you walk, you have a longer trail. So there's, there's experience that counts for something, but you're still walking and you're still real. And I think that this, the, like I, the reason I even brought this up is because I don't ever think about the future really. Like I don't, I don't have a goal. I've never had a goal. I work on the moment. I just work on what's in front of me. Um, and I, th- and I try to do well. But I don't ever think like if I do this, like if I'm doing this podcast, maybe this will lead to something. You know, I don't think that like I'm doing this podcast to have this conversation with you right now. That's why I'm doing it. That's that is the sole reason for this this exercise. And I think that's a it makes sense to me as a way to live. Um, And I think that when people say, well, where do you see yourself in so many five years or 10 years or whatever? it suggests that anybody could ever see themselves anywhere and that yeah. and I just don't think they can and I think that it would be it would be beneficial to all involved if kids were given the sense that they 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 count and they're valid um, and that if they do well with themselves now that they will arrive somewhere and to trust that they will as opposed to doubting they will yeah, I, that was. <laughs> Thank I mean, you. that that was that was like an eye-opening thing to yeah. listen to. I Thank mean, that's you. a good point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, first off, I was born in 1962. I didn't have a single vote on that decision whatsoever. Like, I just woke up. Yeah. <laughs> did you have any? Did you have any vote on where you when you woke up? Last time I checked, no. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. I, right. So I feel like we just are. This is another thing. People often say, like, I have friends who are my, I'm only, I'm 58. I'll be 59 in April. 
And I have friends who say, man, we're so, I'm so old now. I'm so old. And I think, no, first off, hear about this. If you're hungry, eat some food, right? If you're tired, take a nap. If you're cold, wear a sweater, right? If you're bored, do something. But you can't do anything about being old. You can just be what you just are. There's no antidote, right? You just yeah. are. So there's not anything to talk about, really. We're not old. You're not young and I'm not old. We just are. We just are what we are. And either, you know, if you're either, you know, we're interested in speaking with each other or we're not, but it's not an age issue. Right. And I, that's why I hope you can see, like, I'm not, I'm just talking to you. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm just being straight up. Like you, you, I, you know, we're just talking and I don't feel old and I hope you don't feel young. I hope that you just, no. like, right. You just, we just are, you know, and that's, and I wish people could, I think the age the sort of, issues of, of being old or young or this kind of weird discrimination or this sort of pejorative yeah. thing it's weird what's wrong with our society i don't I get was, it yeah i was kind of gonna i was gonna agree with that because like there's been some people like that i've talked to you know and like or just like like you said like a weird like discrimination thing it's like i'll go up to people and I, like i can tell when somebody's talking to me and somebody and when somebody's talking to me because i'm 13 like right. they can, yeah. they talk to you differently for sure. Like right. some, some teachers don't always realize what grade they're teaching. You know what I mean? And they don't talk to you. Like you actually have a say in things, if that makes sense. I don't right. know. Yeah. yeah like, or sorry. No, go ahead, Don. Yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of like, like even conversations on here where it's like, Hey buddy. And not like conversations yeah, yeah. where like, like, I don't <laughs> think if we were 20 years older, I don't think they would have given us the, same answers yeah so that's interesting yeah. i love hey buddy I love, <laughs> you're, you're funny i, mean, I like that's that that's what it felt like <laughs> yeah well it's weird it's, it's it's but i think it's a um there's something going on like i have this <clears throat> i have a sense in our culture i could be wrong about this this is another weird issue about um the way people perceive aging uh, I think that, uh, first off, if you think about life, like in the beginning, when we're born, like, you know, like we're this little tiny package, right? And then there's like this enormous amount of evolution, right? Like you we get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and then we can talk and we can walk. And there's all this changing, like you just change, 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 change. But when you're around 18, you hit, like you kind of grown to what you're going to be grown to. And you kind of look kind of the way you're going to look and you everything's just, for like 30 years it's like a plateau right and then you have another evolution your body starts to change you start to like you know you might lose your hair you might develop wrinkles or spots or whatever you might your your shape of your body may change your hair might turn gray or whatever you know like there's a you know we our bodies start to evolve or devolve, however you want to look at it. <laughs> um, but it's another, it's a shift. It's a, it's a shift. And, you know, you've heard of adolescence, right? Like when you're an adolescent body developing. And I always think it was a sort of, it's like geriatric adolescence at the end. It gets another shift. So you have this 30 years where you're really, you think you know who you are. Um, now I'm on, you guys haven't gotten to that 30 year. You haven't started that thing yet. But when you're on the other side of it, then you can look back and go like, wait a minute, that, that's who I am. Like I was that. And now yeah. I'm not that anymore. So I think it gives people who are older, this weird, they get, they develop this um, maybe even contempt for young people as a, res, as a result, maybe because they see youth as something that they're no longer young. Or I don't know. Um, meanwhile, I have, like, I think that young people, and I mean, like, young adults, mostly, there's a contempt for a kind of a weird contempt for old people. Um, and I think, and that could be wrong, this is just an idea that, you know, for centuries, for however long humans have been around, there was 
like somebody like for instance you must know somebody who's like in their 70s or 80s right do you know anybody yeah like so did you ever know them at a time where they weren't old no (laughs) right right so you can't really imagine them as say a 20 year old yeah it's like looking through like grandparents photo books and you're like that's you Right. (laughs) right exactly so the point is that they occupy a certain fixed place like they're the older people right and in life i think in societies older people were considered the ones who had experience and were respected as a result because they're also part of the family so but then i think they're always just older and you never could tell like you're looking at photos of your grandparents at 20 year old but for years there's no photos at all right for yeah. hundreds of thousands of years, there's no way to really actually see. And I think in around the 1930s, when motion picture started getting sound, and by the 1960s, the people who were in those movies were aging. And I think people in the 60s, younger people, could see, say, Bob Hope or people like these, like, stars who are old people but then you could see this video um evidence of them as young and dancing and talking and laughing and then you can juxt you can juxtapose the two things and it's terrifying because it means that's where i'm going right and i think that at that point that was a point in time where in society a sense of kind of um a negative kind of there's a negative or a, 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 a what's the word a stigma put on old people because people were scared because they could see the direction position um and i think it changed the way people thought about old people and now it's i mean people don't take old people seriously even you know not everybody but i'm saying just in general in society yeah i mean i feel like in some cases it goes both ways too it's like that way that's why there's always seems like there's a conflict between like millennials to to you know like older you know like the two age groups i feel like there's always been a conflict between them because it's like well kids are like um they always say like kids are different than how they were and then the kids are like oh well like you're old and it's like an age yeah, thing like you had it so like, different right, right like you yeah. have it so easy <laughs> right, right 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 <laughs> it just keeps going back and forth. There's plenty of things to compare on. Of course life wasn't the same 80 years ago. Like that's not how it works. <laughs> right. That's the yeah. evolution. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> I mean it's, that's the thing. Though. It's you know there is per- it's perpetual change and it's funny. I I have a 12-year-old kid. I have a son who's 12 and there was an interesting moment in time where I realized like wow, he's like I started to feel like well he's not his childhood is so I can't relate to it because my our childhoods are so different like i grew up in a big mm-hmm. family in the 70s i had you know three sisters and a brother and i lived in a neighborhood that was teeming with kids and the parents are all insane um and you know all you want to do is just get out of the house that like you wake up just yeah. get out and get away from the house and we would just go in the streets and be out all day on the streets and and then my son is not, he doesn't want to get out of the house and there are no kids on the street to speak of, like just hanging, hanging around. You got to organize everything. Um, and so I started to feel like, oh man, I, I started to worry because he's not like his experience is so different than mine. And then I realized actually, like who knows my, my life is just what happened to me. And it doesn't <laughs> mean that he's having a worse experience. We're just having, it's a different circumstance. Like his like in my life, there was a real sense of like, get away from the house, <laughs> just get yeah. away. And he doesn't feel that. So that's a good thing, right? That he doesn't want to get out of the house, you know? Yeah. And, I mean, yeah. I would say that that was a good thing as far as your parenting goes, if he doesn't right. want to get away from you. Yeah. But like, yeah. Like my mom says that all the time. She's like, oh, well, we were out like all day, like the entire day. Like and when I'm the like, street lights uh, might come right. on. Then... Yeah. Right. Yeah. But are they, putting you, are they putting you out there? No. no, I mean, yeah, so, so I mean, and they, but it's weird when people say, like, not that your parents say this, but I've heard parents say, I don't get it. My kids never go out, but you don't put them out. Like, you got to, like, say, go, you know, go out. You yeah. know, they're like, but it's fun. I remember actually, like, uh, when our son Carmine was, um, I don't know, in kindergarten or something like that. And Amy said, Oh, we should probably should do like a, a day camp for him in the summer. 
And my initial reaction was like, oh, no. Like, you know, just let him have his summer to hang with his friends. And she goes, there are no friends to hang with because they're all in day camp. Yeah. And I, and, and I had never occurred to me until – I had never been a parent. I was my first time being a parent. I never even thought about it. I just assumed like, oh, it's, you know, school's out. You get a free three months. But then you realize, sure, he can have, he can just sit around for three months, but all of his friends are in camp. So he's not seeing anybody. So really to get a proper hang, he's got to go hang at a camp. And it's just a really, it's just a shift in time. And it was, I was, I've been learning a lot. All good. Everything's fine. <laughs> it's our yeah. it's, it's, it's our station right we we navigate the road that's in front of us yeah it's definitely a weird time to be a uh, 13 year old uh, and, sure. an ama- and an amazing yeah. time i mean yeah. first off you didn't have do you you had no choice in the time right yeah right so good for you we're here yeah i mean it's definitely been interesting because like we said there's you know, with coronavirus, there's no like real stop or, you know, it's like just kind of happening. So we've been thinking about well, we're in eighth grade, like imagine starting high school on a computer. Yeah. Like weird, you know, because like kids come weird. from all sorts of places. So you're not going to know anybody. I yeah. suppose, but I often think, I think about kids who are like in first grade. That's yeah. hard. To yeah, me, that's that really hard. About. Like I a box. Have, um, I mean, you I guys have, know about, you guys know about the light box. Yeah. My next door right. neighbor he uh is just starting kindergarten which i feel so bad right. like how yeah. do you do that online like, yeah but you figure I, I that's understand. what i'm saying <laughs> but they'll figure it out that's the thing like you can't yeah we can't look at our experiences and then feel sorry for somebody else you can't anthropomorphize things you gotta yeah. you have to assume like it's just what it is and we're gonna navigate it and like they like when i was a kid when i was six years old dc had terrible horrible riots after mlk was assassinated i mean i was terrified it was the world was so 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 scary back then there was stuff that was going on and i don't think like oh i feel so bad for myself i don't it's just that's what we just figured it out and i feel like that we're going to continue to figure things out that's how we that's how humans operate and i think the stress and worry is is um, not beneficial, frankly. I think that it's better to think like, you know, like if I was, for instance, have you ever woken up <clears throat> and uh, you look outside and it's been a blizzard and you're like, you're not going outside, right? Yeah. And yeah. And you have this sort of feeling like, well, good, like it's all good, like the whatever practice is canceled, you know, whatever's yeah. Like that, that's kind of how I feel. Like we're just, it's just an environmental situation and we shouldn't worry or stress about it. We should really focus on, okay, that's what do we need to do? You know, let's figure out how, you know, make sure we have food, make sure we're taking care of each other, taking care of our neighbors, you know, being thoughtful about that, but being stressed and worried is not, that doesn't necessarily help anything. Yeah. I mean, I think looking at, looking at our hard times as like something that we like overcome and not something that we had to go through is right. different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a totally different mindset that way. Yep. I agree. I also really think that um, like there's a lot of things to be unhappy about if you look in the direction of those things, there's far more things in the world to be happy about. Yeah. Right. So I really am pretty adamant about staying. I stay pretty positive about things. Um, I said when uh, in 2016, after the election, everybody was so upset. And I said, listen, they got the White House. They got the Senate. You know, they got the, the courts. Don't give them your joy. Like, don't they took those things. Don't give them your joy. Because really, I, I want to be I believe that people who are uh, trying to do well in the world, people who believe in the idea of progressiveness in the sense of it being good for the world, um, I think that like those people should be clear that they're ha- like, there's happiness involved, there's joy. If they're miserable, who wants to join with that? Like if you're just miserable, 
who wants to be miserable? So I think it's important that if you if you're walking on the street and you see one house and the curtains are drawn and the doors are bolted shut and you hear moaning in there, you're like, I don't want to go in that house, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? I don't feel welcome and I don't want to go in there. And there's another house where the windows are open and there's like a cup of tea waiting for you and the people <laughs> there, the door, you know, I think that's sort of more the environment. They can be in the same block, right? But the question yeah. is, like, if we are together, shouldn't we still think in terms of like, what's good about the world? And then hopefully that would attract people, um, attract more people who are like-minded. I think that seems like a, uh, that's how I would like to think. Like I've, I know a lot of political people, a lot of extremists. And I've known people involved with um, underground political groups. And there are some who are deeply unhappy and I don't want to be around those people. Most, however, are joyful because they're trying to do the good thing. And, and they, and that's what they they seek. Like people said to me, like in my songs, a lot of times I seem very angry. I don't know if I'm really that angry. I think that what people don't take into account is that if you're singing very fast over a very loud music in a room that's very, very hot, that you tend to have to yell, you know, like you have to. Yeah, really, you're not going to scat. <laughs> right, like, right. I can't, you're not going to croon, right? So your whole time, I'm really, I lean into it. And there are things I'm sure I was frustrated about or upset about, but at some point, a friend of mine said to me, what, like, all your songs have no and don't and, you know, and the very negative. And I thought about what she said. And I realized, I started thinking a lot about my lyrics and the work I was doing. And I thought, what is the intention? Like, what was the intention? Why, what are all these punk bands, like, what are we trying to achieve? What are these political people, what is it, what are we hoping to achieve? And I, for me, I, the idea is that I'm trying to achieve a better world, like for everybody. Like, that's really the idea like, that I want, like, no murder. That's what I want. I want no pain. That's what I want. Um, I want people to be peaceful and joyful. That's what I want. And, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized that I knew a lot of people who were in bands who were very unhappy and really singing about how unhappy they were, but they didn't seem to be. And I thought, well, that's like the one thing they can actually have a vote in, right? The thing they can actually affect change in, which is themselves, they have decided to not enact. They are not joyful. And I thought, I'm going to just, I've decided I'm going to be happy. Um, not Never resting, still working, as you can, I mean, I'm working now. Um, but also allowing just myself to be happy because I feel like that's the direction. That was the idea. That's what the songs were about. It's about, it's not that I was mad at, you know, somebody's betrayal because I wanted to be betrayed my whole life. It's because I want to be able to trust people. And yeah. part of being trusting people is feeling safe and happy. So I'm going to feel safe and happy. That's what I'm going to do now. That way, the betrayal that I was so upset about doesn't win the game. Like they can't take from me the ability to be happy or to feel safe. Yeah. They may have threatened it and I've sung about it, but having sung about it, I'm not going to give that to them. Well, Ian, thank you so, so much for your time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th this this was crazy. You said a lot of important things. I'm probably going to like rewatch this every morning for inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sorry if we didn't talk much about music. I don't know if you had a lot of question about music, but no, we, you know. we don't no mind. Worries. We'd yeah. rather have a conversation with somebody and everything you said was great. So, well, listen, I, I love, I love the, the short uh, format and I really enjoy talking to you guys. So if you want, maybe in a few months time, if you want to, we can do it. We can have another recap. If you want to, or if you feel yeah. like, Oh, let's talk again about some other subject. If you wanted to kick it around, I'd be happy to see you all again. Of course. All right, totally. Thank, totally. You, so Thank much. you so much. Yeah, and when the, and maybe when this whole uh, thing is over, and, and it will be, by the way, um, at some point, 
we'll get I, I this is i have to say like i could be if, i mean if i'm wrong it's going to be pretty big no one's going to write nothing and none of this will matter anymore um <laughs> you know what i'm saying but yeah human beings have been through horrific horrific things in the past oh yeah much worse much 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 worse um and we're here still humans are still here and most of the world and most of this country and most of even the people who are on whatever side you're on the other side most of those people are good people they have different ideas but they're good people and they don't wish ill and i really i believe that you know uh if you go if you went to a party right let's say you went to a party and there's 30 people at that party mm -hmm. And there's 14, like, really fascinating conversations going on, right? So two, 14 little two-person conversations, incredibly mind-altering, beautiful exchanges. But one fist fight. Everybody talks about the fist fight the next day. That's, yeah. the, way, yeah. that's the way humans work. That's so, a good <laughs> so the negativity that you see in the media... That is really like, that's their thing. Like the, they are curating what reality is for us. So you have to be really mindful when you engage with the medium, like the, the media's medium, you have to be mindful. Remember, take with a grain of salt what they are showing you. Because when they show the camera on the person who's beating up somebody, they're not turning the camera to the people who are trying to stop it, right? They're not turning the camera. If there's no fights, they're not even running the camera. So there's something in, the, in that industry that is, does not serve the general public because I think it, it leads us to um, really be suspicious or even leads us to hate other people. And I can't see the benefit of that at all. Yeah. Um, so you have to wonder, so what is it the media is up to? The media is a business. And every time we click, they get a dime or whatever they get, right? So they're not going to show you the boring stuff. Yeah. They're going to show you the sensational stuff. So as long as we're aware of that, and we keep in mind that there's good, more good people in the world. Then we think, all right, we can we can get through this. We can navigate it. And to that end, when this thing's passed, which it will be at some point, since you're in Baltimore, which is not very far, um, and since your parents are interested, I assume they are. You said they are fans. Um, maybe you all can get in the car and come down, and I can show you around Discord House. Actually, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'd right. be down anytime. Cool. All right. <laughs> Great. Uh, it's been a blast. Say hi to your mom and dad. All right. Thank All you. Right. <laughs> Take it easy. See you all. Bye. Bye.